Hello, everyone. I'm Michelle Carter, and we are here at the Aram Public Library live on Facebook with amateur butterfly enthusiast Teresa DeWitt. Welcome, Teresa, and welcome everyone who's watching us on Facebook tonight. When you have a question, please post it in the comments. And here you go, Teresa. Please share your wealth of butterflies with us. Thanks, Michelle. Um, as Michelle said, my name is Teresa, and I am joining you from Council Bluffs, Iowa this evening. Um, so the first thing I want to tell you is that this is my first time doing this, a live uh, webinar on Facebook. So um, be patient and bear with me. Um, and if you have any questions, please, please do ask, and I will try to answer them at the end. So I have a uh, PowerPoint that I put together so you can see some pictures and I will share my screen right now. Okay, so uh, the title of my presentation this evening is Monarch Magic and I'm a storyteller. I work at the Council Bluffs Public Library in the kids department. So of course all good stories start with once upon a time. And I titled this Monarch Magic because monarchs are magic. From start to finish, the whole process of the monarch life cycle is magical. Um, so once upon a time, this story starts with baby ducks. And like I said, um, I work in the youth department. And so in the spring of 2018, we decided that we would get six duck eggs and incubate them and hatch them for the kids and maybe a little bit for us um, and it was super fun and there is nothing cuter or funnier than a baby duck but baby ducks need homes and so we realized fairly quickly that hatching ducks every year was not going to be very sustainable for us um, because really the world doesn't need more baby ducks. They were fun once, but then we decided for the time and energy, we'd like to do something that was maybe more helpful um, to the universe, to the, to the planet. Um, so we kind of looked around and a little over a year later, my coworker said, hey, what do you think about raising and releasing monarch butterflies? And I thought, well, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Monarch butterflies are beautiful. Um, and I knew that I had milkweed growing in the ditch um, across the road from my house. So I volunteered. I volunteered to be the person to go see if I could find some eggs and to try raising them at home first before we took the show on the road and, and did it for the kids and the public at our library. And so we got really lucky. My daughters and I went out to the milkweed patch and you can see us, those are my daughters right there. They got drafted to help me look for eggs. And we got super lucky our first time out, we found eggs. And this is what a, a monarch egg looks like on a milkweed leaf. And generally they're on the underside of the leaf. And then um, pretty soon we had our first caterpillar. This is my very first monarch caterpillar. And I'm gonna tell you right now, this is exactly the moment that I fell in love. I was hooked, um, magic. And what, um, looking back on that moment, I had no idea how much I didn't know at this point. Um, so it's a huge learning curve. And uh, I'm going to try to share with you some of the stuff that I've learned. I am not an expert, um, but I have learned, I've learned some things in the last year. And um, one of which is I did not know, maybe I knew at one time, but a year ago, I did not know that butterflies start as eggs. Um, I did know that caterpillars turn into butterflies, but I did not realize that they started as eggs. And a monarch caterpillar in particular only eats milkweed. Um, without milkweed, there are no monarch caterpillars. There are no monarch butterflies. 
And so um, if you remember nothing else from our time together, I want you to remember that we need milkweed, plant milkweed. And I'll talk more on that uh, later. Okay, so here's the monarch butterfly life cycle. And um, so they're in the egg takes three to four days to hatch after it's laid. It's all dependent on temperatures. So warmer temperatures, the egg will develop faster, the, the caterpillar will develop faster. Um, colder temperatures slows the process down. So this first picture, um, there's a itty bitty by the penny. So you can get a sense, hopefully get a sense of how truly tiny uh, they are when they start out life. And it's amazing to me that any of them make it to be a butterfly because they are so um, defenseless and they just seem, it just seems very perilous to be a, a caterpillar. Um, and so the caterpillars don't have bones, they have an exoskeleton. And every so many days they shed that exoskeleton or molt and then they get bigger. So, and each phase is called an instar. So this itty bitty is a first instar. It sheds its exoskeleton, it molts, and it becomes a second instar. The process repeats itself and, and the caterpillar gets bigger and bigger. Um, and then here's a fourth instar and a fifth instar caterpillar. And I'm just gonna tell you now, I love the whole process, but fourth and fifth star caterpillars are the bomb.com. They are so fun. They're super active. They are all about eating. They eat nonstop and they are so into eating and they're so happy when they're eating these little filaments. I used to call them antenna, but I have learned that on, on caterpillars, they are called filaments. They're so busy eating those filaments, just, just shake and wiggle as they're eating. So it's just super fun to watch them. So they're in, in a caterpillar phase for seven to 17 days. And then all of a sudden they crawl to the top of the enclosure. I, I am raising them um, in enclosures to keep them safe. Um, so they will crawl to the top of the enclosure and spin a silk pad. And then they hook their rear legs into that silk pad and then release the rest of their legs and they hang in this J formation. So um, when I'm talking with my butterfly friends, we're talking about how many do you have in J? This is what we're talking about. Um, and so they're in the J formation for 24 to 48 hours and then they form the chrysalis. And this year I was lucky enough to watch a couple caterpillars actually um, form the chrysalis. And right here on their head, that exoskeleton breaks open and you can see the green of the chrysalis underneath their skin. And they wiggle and shake and work and work and work and get that skin all the way up to this very top part up here. Um, and then that skin eventually falls off. And then you're left with this gorgeous green um, chrysalis, not a cocoon. Moths make cocoons, butterflies make a chrysalis. Um, so this is a chrysalis. And um, it's the most beautiful green I've ever seen. And I feel like right here is when the magic really starts because prior to this, this was it was just a caterpillar. And now all of a sudden that cal caterpillar is gone. And you said, and you have this beautiful chrysalis. So then they're in this chrysalis um, for eight to 15 days. And again, depending on the temperatures, um, warmer temperatures speed the timeline up a bit. And when it's time for that butterfly to emerge or eclose from the chrysalis, they don't hatch or they're not born, they eclose from the chrysalis um, about oh, maybe two days before they're ready to eclose. The chrysalis will kind of start changing colors. You can see this one's getting closer. It's a lighter green. And then right before eclosure, it's clear. You can see through that chrysalis um, and how it all happens. 
is just magical to me. I know there's scientific explanations, um, but even with even though the science behind it, it's still magical that a caterpillar can turn into this butterfly. So the chrysalis will open at the bottom and the, the butterfly comes out head first. And then with these spindly little legs, it grabs onto that chrysalis, the empty chrysalis shell, and it hangs um, with the wings facing down um, for several hours. So, so when they first come out, those wings are all just crumpled. They had to be all crumpled and folded up to fit in that little um, chrysalis. And you can see how small it is in comparison to the butterfly. And so the butterfly then is hanging, wings down, and um, it takes about 20 minutes for the wings to fill up. And you can see the body of the cat of the butterfly is like pumping fluids into those wings. And then about two to four hours later, the wings are dry and the butterfly is ready to fly. Um, and then here is a picture of the very first butterfly that I released. Um, and its name was Freddie Christine. Yes, I do know. Um, so the whole process takes about 30 days from start to finish, from egg to butterfly, 30 days. And um, so I wanna go quickly. Here's, here's the thing I learned. Butterfly, monarch butterflies, migrate. So this fall right now, the butter, the monarchs are heading south. They're heading to Mexico. And then in the spring, they will fly those migrators. They're in Mexico, fly, fly to, let me go to my next slide. They fly up through, up into Texas, lay eggs. And then that generation comes further north into Iowa, they lay eggs, that generation keeps going north all the way up into Canada. And then in the fall, they turn around, that fourth generation turns around and starts heading back to Mexico. So um, the, first, the first three generations, they're all about um, reproducing, making more butterflies. To, to support the population going north. That fourth generation, the ones that are that are that you see now, they live for about eight months and their whole purpose is to migrate. So when they come out, uh, when they eat close from the chrysalis, they're all about flying. And I can totally see it in the butterflies that I've been releasing. I open up the enclosure and they're gone. And they're almost, almost, I would say nine out of 10 of them head south immediately. Um, they've got a long ways to go, it's about 3,000 miles. Um, and they head down, not just to where it's warmer, not just across the border. They head down to Southern, I would call that Southern Mexico um, to spend the winter months. And over here, I put a chart that shows when the peak monarch migrations are. In Council Bluffs, I'm at latitude 41. So September 8th through the 20th was our peak migration. And I looked, Aaron Public Library is at latitude 42. So your peak migration is behind us now. Um, let's see here. So this is what it looks like when they are wintering in Mexico. They're in the Oyamel Forest in central Mexico. Um, and each little butterfly weighs approximately um, the weight of a paper clip. And so it's amazing to me that that little butterfly flies 3,000 miles to Mexico by itself. They're not migrating in a flock like, like a bird does. They're just on their own flying to Mexico. And there's so many of them in the forest. Look at how there's so many on those tree branches that it is, it is weighing the branches down. I think that's fascinating and very brave. Those butterflies are very brave. So what I just recently learned actually when putting together this slideshow for you was that um, the monarch butterfly that we have this is Danaeus plexippus plexippus is the only monarch subspecies that migrates. And it's the one we have in the Midwest. So this is our monarch and it is threatened. 
and the threats are, there's so many threats against the monarch population and it is at a dangerous, a dangerous level right now. Um, the Xerxes Society is petitioning the US Fish and Wildlife Service to declare the monarchs a threatened species. And that's how, um, that's how threatened they are. So the major threat is habitat destruction. Um, like I said, milkweed is the only thing that the caterpillars eat. And without milkweed, you do not have monarchs. And so declining milkweed across the US and Canada is a major threat. Um, and then, then when they migrate, the, the forests in Mexico, um, illegal logging is destroying the forest as are avocado plantations. And I put a sad face there because I really love avocados. But since learning this, I have not eaten one. Um, and, and these two things, the logging and the avocados is a tricky situation because um, the people who live near the wintering grounds, they need to make a living too. Um, but when the, when the logs, when the trees are cut down, when the avocado plantations are put in, it threatens the habitat, the wintering habitat of the monarchs. And if they don't have a habitat to go to, they're gonna die. Um, other threats are climate change. The more extreme weather events can interrupt the migration. Um, I experienced it on a very small scale just recently with my outside, my outdoor enclosure. It was crazy cold here. And I thought, what, what would these guys do in the wild, you know, without, without my help? Um, I have my enclosure all wrapped up in plastic to protect it from the wind and the cold. Um, parasites, disease, commercial butter farm, butterfly farms um, affect the DNA. Um, very, I'm, I'll try not to get too technical here, but the researchers think that the commercial butterfly farms of butterflies that are bred in captivity lose the ability to migrate. Um, so that's, that's a major issue. And then pesticides, herbicides, common household chemicals all affect not only the caterpillars, but also the butterflies. When a city sprays for um, mosquitoes, it's not just mosquitoes that die, it's butterflies. The spray leaves a residue on milkweed, that's gonna kill the, the caterpillars. And without the caterpillars, you don't have the butterflies. So there's lots and lots of threats it's a scary world out there for monarchs and for the people who care about them. Um, so as promised, I'm not going to quit harping on the milkweed. Um, a, a study that was just published by the University of Kansas said that sustaining the monarch migration will require the restoration of over a billion milkweed stems in the upper mid Midwest. Um, I suggested to my husband that I try to do that in my yard. Um, and he thought maybe I should um, include it in my presentation today so that y'all can help me. So um, plant milkweed. And if there are any questions, these are two of my caterpillars. Look at how funny they are. Look at those filaments. And they're just eating away on that milkweed. So thank you, Teresa. That was fabulous. And can I just say your images are beautiful and lovely. Oh, thank and you. I spend a lot of time with my caterpillars. <laughs> and it looks like they have like just little dots of a nose. Do they have a nose? Um, not, they can smell, but their nose is not on the face where you think it is. It's elsewhere on their body. They're so cute. So we do have a question. Uh, Nicole Strazer Hawkins from Forest City, North Carolina wants, Hi, <laughs> wants to know, I think she's asking about the zone, the zone where North Carolina is in relation to the monarchs. Um, you, sh you have monarchs in North Carolina. What I would do is like to find, to find Aram Public Library's um, zone, I just typed in latitude, Aaron Public Library. So I would just type into Google um, latitude, wherever your address in North Carolina, and it will tell you. Okay, 
So I don't see any other questions for today, but don't despair our Facebook Live audience. We have Teresa and her monarchs back for the next two Wednesdays, and you can join us. I'm getting back to my Zoom. You can join us for more questions and more monarchs next Wednesday, 6 p.m., Wednesday, September 30th. And next week, Teresa's gonna talk about the monarch's actual journey from egg to adult. So we all look forward to seeing you next week and thank you everyone. And please during the week as we move forward, if you have questions, um, please post them underneath the Facebook post and Teresa will get to them through the week. So thank you everyone and thank you, Teresa. And I'm really looking forward to more pictures next week. Thanks, Michelle. All right, bye-bye everyone.